<clears throat> All right, hello everyone. So one of my subscribers just emailed and asked me to teach on a passage of scripture from Luke and um, he pretty much, you know, implied that um, that maybe others needed me to teach on this. So we're just going to do a teaching on the channel, okay? And if you have questions about passages of scripture, um, especially if it's New Testament, that is more so my strong suit. But if you have questions about any passages of scripture or any topics, you know, please do, you know, uh, shoot me an email. And I will seek the Lord and ask him if he wants me to teach on it for you, okay? So let's just open in prayer. Father God, Yahweh, Holy Spirit, Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth. <sighs> I just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to uh, teach your lambs, your sheep, Lord. I just ask, Lord, that you would... Um, just come and speak through me right now, Lord. I've already prepared for this, but as always, I request and welcome and invite um, anything that you want to just speak through me spontaneously, Lord. I ask in the name of Yeshua, the Christ of Nazareth, that you would um, prepare hearts for this teaching and give them um, comprehension, that you would give them the spirit of understanding, Lord. I ask for this in the name of Yeshua, the Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Okay, so the passage of scripture that I was asked to teach on is Luke chapter 14, um, verse 25 through 33. So, uh, you know, if you want to get your Bible, um, something to write with, maybe a highlighter, notepad, if you're the type that wants to take notes, etc. Okay. Um, and really, this is also going to be like a meta level teaching of just how to how to really study God's word. Um, it's it's not that hard in our day and age with with the technology that we have at our fingertips through the internet. Um, we have a lot of resources that make things a lot uh, easier, more convenient, and, and quicker these days. So I just went and re-read this, refreshed myself on it, and the Lord led me to just go look some things up. So let's just read the passage, and then we're going to circle back and break things down, okay? So start, starting in verse 25, I'm reading from the New King James translation. The subtitle in my New King James is, Leaving All to Follow Christ. Okay, starting in verse 25. Now, great multitudes went with him, referring to Jesus, and he turned and said to them, verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Verse 27, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple verse 28. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Verse 29. Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. Verse 30. Saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. <clears throat> Verse 31, or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down and first consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Verse 32, or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. Verse 33, so likewise... Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. <clears throat> so, I tried to 
read this with like fresh eyes to see, okay, what is it that people might be thrown off by or confused by? And the first thing that occurred to me was in verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. The word hate, right? It's a strong word. And, you know, at first glance, that seems, <clears throat> it seems contradictory to Christianity, right? If Jesus, if Christianity, Christ is all about love, if, if God is love, which scripture tells us, why would he want us to hate our loved ones, right? So here's what you can do. Here's what I did, which can be very helpful. You just type into your internet browser the the book, the chapter, the verse, and then just type in the word lexicon. L-E-X-I-C-O-N. Lexicon. Okay? And that will give you a breakdown of the original language, and then you can do what's called drilling down. You click on each word and then you go read everything, all the different connotations, all the different meanings that that word has. Okay. So the original language here where it has the word hate, it means to love or esteem less. And if you really read further, it even says that it can mean to denounce. To denounce, okay? And to denounce in this context means in terms of who is your ultimate, ultimate, ultimate number one. Who is your God, okay? So what it is saying here is that your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brother, your sister... And even your own life, which that can be broken down, um, none of those is your God. But he, Christ, is your God. He comes first, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be given unto you, right? So you're not going to seek your father first or your mother first or your brother or your sister or your wife or your children or for ladies, your husband, right? Okay, and then... The next thing that I thought that might throw people off is where it says, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So what does that really mean right there? What is your own life, right? Like in this context, what does this mean in this sentence? What Jesus is saying, what he means here is your own agendas, your flesh, your own agendas, um, your own plans, what he's saying here is that to really be a disciple of Christ, you forsake all, which is, you know, that brings us to the last verse, verse 33. He says that, forsake all, okay? You forsake your own plans, your own agendas, um, and even your loved ones. You are willing to drop everything and leave and abandon everything. That's what it means to be surrendered, okay? To be a disciple of Christ, you have to surrender everything. Your fears, your desires, um, those you love, your own agendas, etc. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm having trouble clearing my throat. <clears throat> okay, let's continue on. Verse 27, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So let's break down. What does it mean to bear your cross? Okay, well, that, that saying is... Um, that became a saying after... Jesus was crucified, right? So it's referring to Jesus being crucified. So what happened when Jesus was crucified? Okay, if you go back and you refresh yourself on the scriptures, 
he was beat, he was mocked, he was falsely accused, you know, just, he was persecuted, okay? He suffered. He suffered on a physical level, obviously, right? He was, he went through physical pain, um, but also, you could also say on a soul level, okay, we are body, soul, spirit. On a soul level, he went through pain because the disciples had abandoned him. Um, the people who a week earlier were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, and waving palms um, had now turned and said, crucify him, crucify him, right? So on, on like a mental, emotional level, on a soul level, he was experiencing pain. He was suffering, okay? And you could even say on a spirit level, okay? On a spiritual level, he was experiencing pain because the human aspect of him, I'm sure, was having thoughts of, you know, Lord, why are you letting this happen to me? Even though he knew he was the Messiah. He knew this is why he came right and we see we get a glimpse of him struggling spiritually in the garden of gethsemane if i can pronounce that right garden of gethsemane gethsemane right where he is um so tormented that he's ble he's uh, sweating blood and um he even prays and says you know lord if, if this if this cup can pass from me Please let it, but your will be done, not mine, right? So, to bear your cross means to suffer the way Christ suffered, <clears throat> okay? Um, especially on a body and a soul level, to suffer, to, to suffer means to deny your flesh and that can mean, you know, again, obviously on, on a body level, um, to deny the physical comforts and things like that, but it can also mean on a soul level to deny um, mental, emotional comforts. Okay. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Verse 28. You know what I would really like to do on this channel? Uh, it, it, it keeps coming on my heart more and more and more is I would really like to be more interactive with you guys. I would really like to um, do like, do, uh, you know, lives. I would like to do live uh, teachings where, you know, you guys can type in questions and stuff and I can just answer you on the spot. But I don't really have the means to do that. Um, I don't have a camera the one that someone gave me years ago I uh, I sold and um, I'm just using my iPhone 7 and I've been waiting for the money to come for me to get a laptop I'm using a desktop computer um, and even the the hard drive has been a little compromised and so I, I, I really do I, I really should get a, a new computer but I've been waiting for the the money for a laptop but I just want you to know that, that that's on my heart and as soon as I have the means to to do that I think I think that's what I'm gonna start doing is start doing like lives where you guys can type in questions and I can answer you and interact with you more on a on a on a, on a live basis anyway let's continue on verse 28 for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? That's a really long sentence, which is why they break it down. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Okay, so that's like verse 28 through 30. Okay, so the next thing that I thought that might kind of puzzle people is tower. Why did Jesus choose to use the word tower, right? And so I went and looked that up in the lexicon, and it says a fortified structure. A fortified structure. And... A tower also implies, you know, something that is 
very tall or far reaching, okay? Um, symbolically, the tower is anything, um, fortified structure. Holy Spirit, will you please give me the words, Yeshua, Yahweh. <clears throat> I'm hearing the word feet, F-E-A-T. A tower symbolizes a feat, something that could be daunting, something that requires much to be accomplished. Uh, it is an endeavor. It's something that's not going to be constructed uh, quickly. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take resources. And it's something that really requires wise planning, prudence, okay? And this is what Jesus is referring to. Does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. Lest after, and lest it means unless, he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And what that, what he's basically getting at there is, there's, there would be a failure. So if someone attempted to build a tower or to accomplish some great feat, right? Like, what's coming to mind right now would be like, um... Like, if an athlete were to, you know, try to win the gold medal at the Olympics or something. That's not something that you're just going to just go and do impulsively. Um, or at, with success anyway, right? Like, you, it's something you plan for. It's something that you invest your resources into. Time and energy, right? It's something you plan. It's something that requires prudence, okay? Prudence is planning ahead, thinking ahead. And that's what the Lord is talking about here. Does not sit down first and count the cost. So let's, let's get into that next, okay? Counting the cost. <clears throat> this is just wisdom. This is just prudence, right? If you have... A thousand dollars to spend for the month and you know that you got to pay your rent you got to pay your phone bill <clears throat> you know um, you got to fill your gas tank you got to buy groceries you're gonna take care of all you know if you're operating in wisdom you're gonna sit down and you know keep track of okay well rent is this much my phone bill is this much groceries are usually this much you're gonna make sure that you allocate your money towards those things or let's say you've got two thousand dollars whatever right you got x amount of money you, you, you're going to make sure that you have enough to cover those costs those expenses right before you go and spend money on something else that maybe you don't necessarily need Right, So it's a matter of prioritizing your resources, making sure that this is really a decision that you want to make. That's what Jesus is really getting at right here is sit down first and consider the cost. Whether he has enough to finish it. Has enough what? I'm going to underline that too. Has enough to finish it. And what's coming to mind right now, what I hear Holy Spirit saying is to finish to run your race, as Paul has told us to do, right? Run your race, finish your race, okay? When he says have enough here, do you have enough faith? Do you have enough faith to finish your race, to work out your salvation, to make him Lord, to follow him, to pick up your cross, to bear your cross and follow him, into death. Now we're getting deep, okay? <clears throat> I was not planning on getting into this. This is Holy Spirit taking over. 
When Jesus picked up his cross and carried his cross, where did he go? He went to death. Because you can't get to eternal life without resurrection, and you can't get to resurrection without first going through death. You have to die to yourself. Do you have enough faith? He says, sit down and consider. Do you have enough faith? Are you willing to have enough faith to pick up your cross, to suffer on a body level, on a soul level, on a spirit level, to follow Christ into death, into dying to yourself, dying to the world, dying to everything, so that you can resurrect to eternal life. And this is deep, right? This is deep because this, this means on a literal level, yes, but it also means on, on other levels. While you're, yes, it's still in your body, still in this tent called your body, while you're still alive and, yes, physically breathing and all that, there's still a death that happens. The true Christian walk is a walk of dying to yourself, of dying to the world, of dying to your idols, dying to your own agendas, dying to lit, like your physical, like literal flesh in the sense of, you know, um, wanting to give up, not wanting to persevere, um, both on a physical level, on a soul level, on a spirit. I mean, this really applies on so many and on every level. Okay, count the cost. Do you have enough faith? And that's a free will decision. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So, what is that referring to there? Failure. Failure. Are you willing to have enough faith? Are you willing to trust God and lean on God to give you the faith to meet you where you're at so that you don't fail, so that you finish your race, so that you, quote unquote, finish building that tower? See, the true tower Wow, we're getting really deep here. What I okay, Holy Spirit. What comes to mind is uh, the passage where the angels were ascending and descending on that ladder to heaven, right? Like the, the stairway to heaven, right? Which the Lord has given revelation in the last couple years that that is. DNA and whatever. I'm getting real deep here. <laughs> A little too deep, I think. Um, Holy Spirit, please bring me back on point. Yeshua, Yahweh. Do you have enough faith? Are you willing to trust God enough to have faith, to choose to have faith, to choose to believe that he'll give you the faith to finish building your tower? Now, what tower do we know of in Scripture, right? The Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was man trying to take a shortcut. Jesus told us that he is the only gate, the narrow gate that few find. It's an internal thing. It's not an external thing. The Tower of Babel was an external attempt at a shortcut. It was the wrong gate. The true tower is inside, in your spirit, in your soul. Are you willing? 
to go higher and higher from glory to glory. Thank you, Lord. From glory to glory, from one level to another, just like a tower has many floors, many levels, right? A tower is a fortified structure. If you look up the definition of what it means to be fortified, it means that it is secured, it is um, protected. So are you willing to have enough faith to trust the Lord that he's going to meet you where you're at? Are you willing to persevere? Are you willing to pick up your cross and suffer and persevere and make and 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 go so and go higher and higher from glory to glory with the Lord through dying to yourself so that you and your faith becomes a fortified structure so that your faith is the tower it is a fortified structure it is secured it is protected through making him Lord, through surrendering to him, submitting to him, obeying him, following him at all costs, suffering. Verse 31, Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider? So there's that prudence again. Both times here he's saying to sit down first, count the cost, sit down first, consider. Think it through, prudence. Whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks, consider, excuse me, conditions of peace okay so what stood what 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 the lord spoke to me on this was <clears throat> so okay so who's going to what king going against another king so you've got an enemy here you've got an opponent okay this is symbolic of satan your adversary okay whether he is able with 10,000 soldiers okay with a army half the size of his enemies basically okay you got 10,000 going up against 20,000 that's half the size of the enemy okay half the size of your enemy's army what is that symbolic of right you got an enemy that's satan obviously jesus is saying the odds are stacked against you in this world Sit down and think that through first. Because here's the deal. The only way that anyone can actually really truly diligently persevere and go through the suffering is if you first are honest with yourself and come to terms with the reality of, of reality. Which is that the odds are stacked against you in this world because this world is ruled by Satan. You will suffer. Jesus promised us that in this world you will have trouble. The odds are stacked against you. Now, I'm not getting in, into literal numbers here. Yes, I'm aware that God's angels are two thirds and Satan's, you know, army is one third in terms of the. I'm not getting in. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking just symbolically. This is what the Lord is saying here that the odds are stacked against you. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have people mocking. You're going to have persecution. Jesus is basically saying, know what you're getting into when you're getting into this relationship with me. Because what does he say in other passages? Because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. He's basically saying, don't bother getting involved if you're not going to really know what you're getting involved in first, because I don't want you falling away. I don't like, don't, don't bother wasting either of our time. He's dead serious. He's, you know, he's putting it all on the table. He's putting all his cards on the table and he's saying, make sure you're looking at all these cards. Look at, 
everything involved here and make a decision because you're either all in or you're out. Verse 32, or else, while the other is still a great way off, the other, the enemy, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. Now, this is very interesting, and the Lord's actually speaking to me right now about this. So the word delegation, okay, that's rooted. The, the, the root word there is to delegate. What does it mean to, to delegate? It means instead of doing something yourself, you send someone else to go do your work for you, to take care of something for you, okay? <clears throat> now, depending on what the context is, in this context, this can imply perhaps some cowardice. Don't cowards operate that way? Instead of doing things themselves, they hide behind someone else and have that middleman do the uh, the more difficult work or the more daunting work, the more scary work, the more confrontational work, whatever you want to call it, right? Okay? So that's one thing that the Lord just spoke to me right now, spontaneously. But before I got on here, what he was saying to me is, okay, so he sends a delegation, he sends a third party, he sends a middleman, he sends someone that he's maybe hiding behind because he, he doesn't want to go do it himself, Okay? and asks conditions of peace. With who? With the enemy. With the enemy. So that means you're conceding. It means you're partnering with the enemy. As opposed to following through, planning and prudence, in faith, trusting the Lord. Okay? There's a lot of depth here in what Jesus was saying. He was saying that you have to really know what you're getting into and then decide wholeheartedly to get into it with him, to pick up your cross and follow him. Because if you don't, if you don't come to terms with the reality of, of the war, basically, that, that we are all born into, of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, if you don't do that, then you're liable to get scared and partner with the enemy. <clears throat> Something else the Lord spoke to me was, okay, it says conditions of peace. What does scripture tell us? <clears throat> to be friends with the world is to be at enmity with God, right? And the world and Satan are pretty much synonymous, right? So this means that you're conceding, you're partnering with the enemy, which means you're at enmity with God. Now we know in other passages where Jesus spoke, he flat out tells us. You're either with me or you're against me. If you're not with us, if you're not with me, you're against me. If you're not with us, you're not for us, right? There's different passages where he says different things. <clears throat> so likewise, verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So again, Jesus is saying, look, here's the deal. You're either all in or you're out. It's, it's the same. And <laughs> yes, Lord, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? This is God's character. He wants fervency. He wants you to be zealous. He wants you hot, not lukewarm. He's saying, look, this is the deal. We're at war. You're either all in or you're out. You're either with me 100% and you're doing this with me. You're following in my footsteps. You're picking up your cross. You're going to die to yourself. You're going to follow me into death so that you can resurrect to eternal life. Or you're with the enemy. Or you belong to Satan. Or you're at enmity with me. 
<clears throat> Lord, is there anything else you want me to say? Yahweh. Again, the Lord has told me that the only people who are going to heaven are the ones who are in the whole who are in the holy of holies. Okay, the 144,000, the ecclesia, <clears throat> and that is made up of the church of Smyrna, which is the martyrs who get, who get killed in the fifth seal, and the church of Philadelphia, which is the officers, including the subcategory of the two witnesses, okay? So what does that tell you? I don't know why I'm led to say this right now, but I am. If you're not an officer in the kingdom, but yet you are completely sold out for the Lord, and you've made him Lord, and you've pursued restoration, you're going to be beheaded. <clears throat> You're going to suffer. You're going to die. The Lord has told me and has had me teaching. You need to make him Lord. That means you submit to him and you surrender to him in every area and aspect of your life. Your sex life, your love life, your finances, everything. Everything. Your relationships. But you also have to have zeal for what he's offering you. When he kicked off his ministry, he quoted Isaiah 61.1, talking about setting the captives and the prisoners free. If you have not been pursuing restoration, also known as inner healing, which includes heart healing, deliverance, and integration, you're probably not in the Holy of Holies, which means you're probably, if, if you were to die right now, you wouldn't be going to heaven. <clears throat> he doesn't want people who are lukewarm. He wants people who are gung-ho, who are zealous, who are fervent, who have sat down, considered everything, and said, yes, Lord, sign me up, I'm in 100%, whatever the cost is. What I'm hearing the Lord say right now is that when he chose his disciples, were shown in scripture that they dropped everything and they followed him. They quit their jobs. They walked away from wives, families. They paid the cost. They abandoned their own lives to have a new life in Christ, with Christ. <clears throat> Lord, is there anything else you want me to say? I think that's it. <clears throat> if there's anything else, uh, I'll put it in the description box below as always. Check the description boxes of my videos in case there's ever any afterthoughts or links or scriptures or anything. Um, if you have any further questions on this passage, you're always welcome to ask curious questions in the comments or shoot me an email. Um, being that this is a teaching video, I will put my email address in the description box below. Um, and yeah, if anyone is led to hook me up with a laptop or the money for a laptop that would be very much appreciated because I really would like to start doing uh, lives I would start I would like to start doing more like just live interaction with people um, I think that's it all right I bless you all in the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth